All right, welcome folks to this weekly workshop. Uh, the aim of the weekly workshop is to help those of you who are in the blue light community to succeed in the police recruitment process. And I know every now and then we even get a serving officer on board who's uh, looking for promotion, specialist interview skills, that sort of thing, can help you as well if you're in that position. So we'll be about an hour. And in a moment, what we'll do, uh, I'm not gonna do some introductions because it just takes up too much time. We've only got an hour. Although it'd be great to get to know you all uh, a little better but what, what I'll do by means of an introduction is just uh, have you randomly put your hand up and say I've got a question about or I'd like some guidance about or I'm not sure about or I've got a conundrum or what do you think I should do um, whatever question you've got about police recruitment I'll have an answer to or I'll know where to get the answer um, I've been doing this now for 26 years uh, 26 years in the police sector, actually 30, 37 years in the police sector now, uh, but 26 of those years has been spent coaching and supporting people in the police sector, initially for promotion boards, specialist interviews, and when I was a trainer as well, and a trainer of trainers, and a trainer of those who train the trainers in the police, uh, but more recently over the past decade, helping people to succeed in the police recruitment process. So I've seen all sorts of things come and go, all sorts of problems come and go and all sorts of problems that are consistent ones and all sorts of shortcuts you can take as well. So I'll be bold here. I don't think there's anyone else in the country who's got as much experience or knowledge about police recruitment systems as I have. If you find that person, will you signpost them to me? Because I'd love to meet them. We could just like geek out all day on police recruitment things. It'd be awesome. Um, all right, great stuff. So um, how's that sound to everyone? You got a thumbs up? Great, brilliant. So um, let's open up the surgery. Who's got questions? Who's got problems? Who's got conundrums? Who needs some direction? Uh, give me a hands up and I'll invite you to unmute yourself. Fantastic. Uh, go on, Tom. So I've applied for Derbyshire Police and I've got an interview on the 31st of March, uh, 9 a.m. So I was going to ask, uh, I've got to do two presentations. One presentation is on a bit about me, why I want to become a police officer, the skills I can bring to the roles, things like that. And then yep. the second presentation is what's known as now the innovation exercise. I think it used to be called the research exercise. And that's about bringing a problem from the community that the police face and a solution to tackle it. And I guess mm. I'll get some feedback on. I think the the line for the second presentation I was going to go down was I wanted to get something a bit out there. And I know student burglary is a topic um, within lots of cities that is never really discussed. And often they've come. And I know as a student I was burgled. I know my neighbours were burgled. I know lots of people were burgled. And I was hoping to come up and maybe bring some ideas to to the interview panel about ways the police can get involved and maybe even increase awareness of this working directly with universities. And just wanted to get some feedback on maybe some more ideas of what I can use. All right, okay, student burglaries. Okay, you've got 10 minutes to deliver each one of those, haven't you? Yep, is that 10 minutes? You've, you've uh, uh, muted yourself again. Yeah, 10 minutes, look, Tom's giving a thumbs up. Great, okay, Tom can take a look at that. And uh, what else have we got? Um, Nailu, did you have your hand up? My interview on the 5th of April and it's going to be my first first try mm -hmm. so I don't know what to expect I applied in 2018 but I was my first year for the uni and they told me come back once you get a degree now okay. I get my degree and the question for you is is the questions for situation judgment test company going to be the same for PCPA or for the uh, it's going to be similar with the ones with for the degree entry hall. Is it going to be the same or different? Okay, and this is so you've got your online assessment centre ahead of you then, not interview. Yes, yeah, so yeah. yeah, yeah. Okay, all right. I've got an update on that as well because we've now got. I was talking about that with someone uh, earlier today. Uh, we've now got the national sift, uh, which some forces are making you do. Some of them are just making making you do a situational judgment test. Uh, College of Policing have now added another layer, which is the behavioural styles questionnaire. I have one. Uh, it's a CBQ questionnaire, which I've done. Is it the same 
is it similar to the interviews questions no um no yeah different i'll i'll outline a little bit of that to you uh Nailu. we'll we'll cover a little bit of that okay i can't okay. one thing i can't do is like i know sometimes people say i'd like you to tell me and share with me everything you can about the online uh, no, obviously i'm not gonna ask that no, um not. and i'd say well have you got 20 hours <laughs> <laughs> because on the online course and on the webinars we do all of that but there's about 20 hours worth so you know i can give you a bit of a foundation things to look at but quite honestly if you really want to deep dive into something that's going to get you through this then it's the online assessment center course and shameless plug tomorrow night we start course number seven everyone who passes everyone who does course number seven who applies himself and does everything i ask him to do will pass it's as simple okay. as that okay. it's as simple as that um because of what i show you gives, gives you a pass you just as people say you've done it just do what brendan says and you will pass uh it's a bit sad really because the online assessment center has become really really formulaic it's just I can get my 13 year old daughter through it. It's just, just sad for the police service, I think, but it is what it is. Take advantage of it. All right, thanks, Neilu. All right, what else have we got? What other questions do we have? Well, let's just let Charlie in the room. Uh, go on, Dan. Hello there. So uh, I've applied, I think, my fourth or fifth application for Devon and Cornwall. Um, and I've got the email to say that I've passed the online assessment course, but haven't been given a date yet. Um, my question is, is because that's sort of as far as it's gone for me. Are, are we told what essentially like the topics are going to be within the final interview, or is that something that we have to sort of cover off as a whole and then pick apart when we actually get to the interview stage? Yeah. Um, so when it gets to, uh, I'll answer that. Actually, I'm, I'm trying. I'm, I almost jumped ahead. Then um, we will tune into that one as well during this hour. Thanks, Dan. Good question. Good question. Um, what else we got, folks? What are the questions? Yeah, go on, Will. Hey, Brandon, how's it going? Good, good. I'm studying for the online assessment centre. I'm doing stage two and stage three, so the uh, interview, written assessment, and briefing. Um, and doing the doing the, the course through through you guys, uh, which has been uh, super useful so far. Um, but I've found from, from watching the videos, from, from doing the worksheets and everything, what has been most challenging is, I think, changing my style and my way of thinking from merely just sort of stating facts and kind of making those broad statements, but actually to a more analytical, more critical style, um, thinking about those different types of questions that you might ask and really kind of digging down into that detail, I think, that, that they're going to want to hear. Um, what kind of one piece of advice would you would you give um, for studying for stage two and stage three in that vein and really just kind of making sure that um, I suppose the answers and the examples and the situations that that you're talking about that you're really kind of hitting that detail and hitting that kind of right style of thinking. All right. Yeah. One piece of advice. Um, I'll probably give one piece of advice for each one of them because they're different bits of advice. All right, appreciate that. <laughs> and actually, I like that. So you probably heard me actually on some of my videos. I like to think about what's the one thing, you know, uh, sometimes we focus on too much detail and we, we can't see the wood for the trees. When in fact, sometimes it's just like three things you need to do or just one thing, one big thing that if you do this, it's going to make um, a huge difference. Um, it's the 80-20 rule that, um, you know, 80% of the of the problems that you have uh, are as a, a result of 20% of the causes. So um, if you think about criminality, um, it's probably 20% of the criminals out there are responsible for 80% of the crime. Actually, I think it's probably more than that. I think it's probably 5% um, of the criminals out there are responsible for 95% of all the crime. Um, so if we just focus on those 5%, we're going to make a massive dent in, in crime. So I really like that approach of that one thing and keeping things really simple. Um, when I was a neighborhood inspector, we, we adopted this approach, which was um, if there's 15 people out there who we know are offending, you can spend lots of time focusing on 15 people who are offending, or you just go for the one at the top of the list and just bring down legal and ethical, as much legal and ethical force as you possibly can 
on them and make them regret the day they ever decided to commit crime. And then once you've got them into the system, signpost them to the things that are going to address the causes. So um, anyway, I'm going off at a big tangent, but I love that sort of concept of one big thing um, always works. All right. Uh, anything else, folks, before we push on then? Yeah, everyone else is just happy just to chill and watch and listen and learn. Right, fantastic. Well, let's look at Derbyshire first. So um, Derbyshire is really interesting because they do the assessment before they do their own interview before the online assessment centre which I think is unusual because that must uh, cost them a lot in terms of resources. And so they're screening people out using their own internal system. And then once you've got through that, you then do the online assessment center. Is that correct, Tom? Yeah, Tom's nodding away. So the first part is where you basically sell yourself. You know, oh, this, is, this is me, this is who I am. These are my skills, these are my values. This is why I want to join the police effectively it's answering the question why do you want to be a police officer does that make sense tom give me a thumbs up yeah he's nodding away tom's nodding away um so they've given you a clue as to the sort of things that you they want you to include now there's, there's so many forces um ask you to do similar things to this uh, nottinghamshire have something very similar uh, but that then leads on to questions about what are the challenges that the police face at this moment in time and how do you feel you'll be able to help us meet those challenges? Um, Durham Constabulary, just very to the point in a very northeastern way, if I can stereotype like that, get straight to the point and just say, so why should we recruit you? You know, just so, but all of those, all of those approaches basically have at their heart, why do you want to be a police officer? And so one of the things I explain on the interview course is, is because uh, people struggle with it and they start coming out with loads of cliches. So Tom, what, what sort of things were you including, thinking of including in your presentation? So I based, I've got a bit of a run through plan already. Um, I've based four events that have happened within my life in the last 18 months around the nine police competencies. And I guess that was justifying why that I can meet these competencies and how I've applied them in these situations. And then leading on to that, um, talking about how the reason I want to be specifically in Durham, in uh, Derbyshire constabulary, constabulary sorry, um, just talks about how the, they've done a specific drive as much as the force have on diversity and how I think diversity is such a big, important part of policing. All right. So from the sounds of it, it sounds like you could start sounding a bit like a competency and values buzzword generator. That could be the danger. Um, yeah, to a certain degree. I don't, I don't ever talk about the competencies directly if they're more implied. And that's, I guess, where I'm trying to go with it. I'm not just trying to shout out that I know all the nine competencies. I'm just trying to say that I can apply them. Yeah, I, uh, there's, there's 10 actually, isn't there? Is it 10? Anyway, whatever number there are. Um, I, I, I maybe have a rethink on that. Um, tell your story, but do it in a sort of timeline process. And, and think about things in your life that you've done and things that your life in your life that you've achieved where you've developed certain skills and certain values and uh, I'd advise stick to that and then when it comes to uh, key moments where you've thought about what you're going to do with a career what, what steered you towards being a police officer what or who has inspired or motivated you uh, so that the, the approach that seems to work really really well I know this because I've done it for 26 years there's a timeline. So there will have been a moment in your, in your life when you were inspired or motivated to be a police officer. Uh, what was that moment? What did you do about it? How did you develop it? How, so you're developing this story, this narrative, and the competences and values will just sort of take care of, them, of themselves through a very natural and authentic story. Um, and it'll sound that way as well, as opposed to something that, I mean, I've not heard what you've got to say, Tom, but so I don't know, but it could sound, a bit contrived it could sound a bit sort of Tom's trying to tick all the boxes and we know he's trying to tick all the boxes but that's not what we want uh, they want something that's a little bit more authentic and a little bit more uh, of you uh, so that I've had many of my clients talk about sort of things like one of the values that I think is really important uh, that I've really focused on throughout my life is is kindness uh, and compassion now you won't find those in the competency and values framework but they're really important 
um, attributes, I think, for being a police officer. And they s speak to the interviewer, this, this sort of authenticity about you, that this is actually who I am and this is what I believe in. So because the thing about the enforced interview part is you can't BS them and you can't gameplay it. For the online assessment centre, you can BS that and you can gameplay that. But when it comes to your interview, you're in front of people like me. And, um, you know, really, really switched on individuals. I'm not saying I was switched on. Well, no, I am a bit switched on when it comes to things like this. You know, I can work out when people are trying to play me, uh, when people are trying to game, game me, uh, when people are trying to tell me what they think I want to hear, where the reality is I, I want to hear about what makes you tick, what, 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 what do you really believe in? What would you, you know, what would you really stand up for? Um, and what your story is in terms of inspiration and what you've done to develop yourself and key moments in your life where um, you suddenly discovered something about you, yourself or you reflected and thought, that didn't go well. Um, and if I want to be a police officer, I really need to improve on my ability to do X, whatever it might be. So I'd, I'd go for that, Tom, a little bit. Is that, is that making sense? Yep. Yeah. Good, clear to the point. Yeah, that's making sense. <laughs> um, so innovation exercise, they, they ask you to look at a problem in the community and they want to hear about ideas that you might have to address those problems, I, I believe, yes? Um, I would go for something a little bit more, I think student burglaries is something that crops up every year, every September. I can guarantee that every September, the neighborhood policing team is thinking, a load of students are going to arrive in Derby University and they're going to be from different parts of the country and some of them just aren't going to be switched on in terms of the security of their property. And they'll go do a load of leaflet drops, social media campaign, um, uh, presentations at uh, in Freshers Week, uh, little stalls at Freshers Week, and uh, they'll be out on patrol looking for open windows and stuff like that, um, is my guess. Uh, am I right, Tom? I assume as much. I, to be honest with you, when I was a student, I never had any experiences like that. But that was basically the jargon of what you were gonna, I was going to have to go through anyway. Yeah, I would. Uh, I would look for something a little bit more challenging. Um, so, do, do you live in Derbyshire now? Uh, just over the border in South Yorkshire, but not far away. Okay. Um, tell me about some of the more challenging areas in, in Derbyshire. Tell me about one area that you know, that you're familiar with, that's really challenging for the police. I think just in general, rural policing. Derbyshire is very long and thin. It's rural, but they have such a, a vast county to cover in such a small space of time with a lot of, especially North Derbyshire, is just rural communities that probably don't have much interaction with the police. Um, there's, there's, lots of, uh, there's lots of forces out there that are like that. They're, 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 give me... Give me something because they're asking for a problem from the community so a problem that within the community what if you if you were the uh, chief constable of derbyshire um what would you be driving to work in the morning thinking i hope x hasn't happened again what would that be i'm struggling to think of one that would be tackling derbyshire specifically other than all police forces all right um i th i think i don't know what's the chief constable's name of derbyshire don't know, haven't researched it yet. Right, okay. Um, this is where I would do this research first before choosing my subject. Because if you gave me student burglaries, I might be thinking, it's not even a problem. It's not even a problem for us, that. Um, it might be, it's an idea you've had, but I'd suggest we're going about it the wrong way. Start looking at what the real problems are for Derbyshire, the things that the chief constable drives to work when the chief constable drives to work, and all of you should know the name of your chief constable for the force that you want to join. What is the thing? What's that one thing? There's that one thing again. What's that one thing that's on their mind? Um, I don't. I don't know off the top of my head who the chief constable is, but my guess, my guess is that it's going to be uh, the distribution of narcotics drugs uh, through violent and highly organised crime gangs into Derbyshire's villages and towns from places like Birmingham, Nottingham, Manchester, Liverpool. 
um, and the uh, gang-related warfare that that creates, and the um, the the impact on vulnerable people in Derbyshire who get drawn into that lifestyle, um, and and you know that that links in it's, that whole thing is called it's got a name now we call it county lines, um, makes it sound you know like sort of thing that should be on line of duty. Um, but actually, it's a very ugly business that's been around for decades, as long as I can remember. You know, the turf wars over who controls the, the drugs market is vicious, um, unforgiving and brutal, absolutely brutal. And uh, vulnerable people get involved. So I'd take a look at that. Um, I'd also take a look at um, something like um, homelessness. Um, vulnerability through homelessness, uh, domestic violence, but w whatever it is, um, Tom, I'd, and for all of you who might have a presentation like this, and for anyone who's watching the replay or listening to this on a podcast, if, if you've got that sort of question about what, what the innovation exercise, you know, research a problem in the community, or what are the biggest challenges that we face, that's a common question now, uh, closely followed by how are you going to help us meet that challenge, then make sure it's something that is actually a big issue in the force. Because otherwise your interviewer is going to listen to you and think they clearly don't understand Derbyshire or they clearly don't understand Nottinghamshire or any other force where you ask that question. They don't understand the force because that's not even a problem. It's not on a list of things to do. Whereas I can pretty much guarantee for a county force, uh, domestic related violence, vulnerability, county lines uh, and the violence that goes with it will be on the agenda, will be on the agenda. Um, and then, you know, there are things you can do as an individual once you're a police officer to help the force counter those problems um, through what I'd suggest is, I mean, there's several different things you can do. Um, and I must, I keep thinking I must do a video for the interview course members on this one. Um, but I'd suggest we want to go down the road of professional curiosity. Um, professional curiosity. Assume nothing, believe no one, challenge everything. Uh, so really think about how you as an individual police officer can, can chip away and help the force. Because you might be, Tom might be, you might be sat there, Tom. I bet Tom used to sat there and thought, what am I going to do whilst I'm a student officer to tackle serious and organised crime? Were you thinking that, Tom? Yeah, well, maybe you should have been, maybe, maybe, maybe. Um, yeah, it's how much of an impact can one person have, especially in big things like county lines. Right, well, I'd suggest massive impact. Um, massive, massive impact. Um, because if, the, the, I used to say this to the communities that I was a part of when I was a neighbourhood inspector in there, to my constables and sergeants. Um, if all of us think what difference can we make, because the problem's too big, then we've lost. We might as well get our coats. Um, but there's a little story I'll tell you, um, which I quite like, and it kind of, uh, I don't know, see what you think, Tom. See what, uh, and everyone else, see what you think. It, not much to do with policing, this story. Well, actually, it might have something to do with policing. So just indulge me for a few moments. We're, we're here for an hour, um, or maybe a little bit more. So uh, I'd like you to all imagine, if you can, a beautiful, beautiful little island in the middle of the Indian Ocean. Can you all imagine that? Even if you've not been to one, can you imagine it? You know, it's got waving palms, beautiful long white sandy beach, um, beautiful greenery. It, it seems to be blue sky all the time, turquoise waters. Can we all imagine that? Give me a thumbs up if you imagine that. Can you, can you picture that in your mind? Awesome. Now in this little island, this beautiful little island, there's uh, a great community. It's just this wonderful, wonderful community. Um, lovely children who sort of skip happily to school in the morning. Everyone goes to school really early in the morning because it gets really, really hot. So they go to school at like seven o'clock and finish at sort of one o'clock in the afternoon because it just gets too hot. And so, um, and also they have that like these like village elders and on one of these really hot days, uh, the village elder, the, the wisest man on the island, I know I could tell a story saying the wisest woman as well, uh, but I'll pick a man. No, actually, let's change the game. The, the wisest woman on the island was walking 
as she does every day uh, around the island, just admiring the beaches, admiring the children going to school and just, it's all good. It's all good. Thinking that life is good. And as they approach one of the beaches, having seen all the children going to school, they see something quite strange. Um, it's one of those days, actually, by the way, where the tide has gone out a long, long way. It's the spring tides and the tide's gone out much further than it normally would, a lot further than it normally would. And the wise woman sees what looks like a child dancing in the sea. And she thinks, I must investigate this because, one, why are they dancing in the sea? And two, why are they not in school? And as she gets closer, she sees it's a young boy who's running in and out of the water, appears to be picking something up from the beach, running into the water, dropping it into the water, and then running back onto the beach, and it's just doing this to and fro. And as she gets closer, she sees, actually, what the little boy is picking up. He's picking up starfish. Because the tide's gone out so far, it's uncovered thousands of starfish, thousands of them, thousands of them. And they're all starting to bake in the, in the sun, baking in the sun. There are, a lot of them are going to die. Actually, all of them are going to die. And the wise woman thinks it's a shame, it's sad, um, but she sees a huge problem. I mean, what can anyone do? And she approaches a young boy who's busy picking up, she sees what he's doing, he's picking up starfish in each hand, taking it into the water where it's deeper, where it's not going to get any shallow anymore. And dropping the starfish in the water, then running back and getting another two, and then dropping them into the water. And she calls him over, young man, young man, come over here. And he says, I can't, I'm too busy. I'm saving the starfish. And she looks at him and goes, but what a pointless task. There's thousands of them. Uh, how can you hope to have any impact whatsoever? And he holds the starfish up in his hand, looks at it, puts it in the water and drops it and goes, made a difference to that one. And so there's, um, I hope there's a message in there um, and I hope it resonates a little bit, Tom. Um, how would that resonate? Um, how would that resonate for you in tackling organized crime and vulnerability? You make a difference to individuals, don't you? Yeah, if you just change the life or change the sense of direction of one person, then you've helped contribute to the force's aim of tackling organised crime. And if every constable in Derbyshire, and every PCSO in Derbyshire, and every sergeant and inspector has that sense of professional curiosity to look below, look beyond the obvious and not see a prob the problem like that as being in, um, insurmountable because it is such a huge problem, and just thinks about what, what can I do today that's going to dig a little deeper than um, most officers would, what can I do to, uh, when I'm at that burglary call um, and it's a, um, a, a single parent who's struggling with two or three children and one of those children is 13 um, and he asks the question, so where, where, where is he at the moment? Oh, I can't cope at the moment. He's just, he, he never goes to school. Um, he comes back in. He's not the little boy he used to be. Warning, warning bells, alarm bells should be going off. Because that's the sort of vulnerable person, that 13 year old who's not the child they used to be, who will give, the mum will tell you or the dad will tell you all the indicators that make us, lead us to believe that that child could well be getting groomed into an organised crime syndicate. Then there's something we need to do. There's something we need to do. There's work to be done with other agencies. Uh, we don't just do a referral, we take responsibility for it ourselves and we get that individual the help they need so that they don't go in that direction in their life and there you go tom, tom you've just you've helped that one person you've helped that one person so it's up to you um i would i'd think about something a little bit more topical um where you're going to stand out a little bit because my guess is lots of people are going to talk about student burglaries um the other the other week on one of the every week we do a practice interview seminar uh, for those who are on the interview course and um, a similar question it wasn't for Derbyshire it was another force where they do ask this question what are the challenges and one of them came up with uh, one of my clients came up with uh, fly tipping 
and she got that off the force uh, force website for a neighborhood policing team who said it's one of our priorities and trust me there is no chief constable drive driving to work in the morning worrying about fly tipping so it's just not the right it's not the one it's not connecting with the people who are actually interviewing you but um, if you look at those sort of things domestic violence vulnerability county lines that'll press the buttons tom that'll press the buttons all good awesome um let's move on uh, let's move on um so uh Nelu, you were asking about um, online assessment center, situational judgment tests, PCDA degree. Uh, quite a few people have asked me this question recently. Is it a different assessment depending on the type of entry route that I'm doing? It's the same assessment, except for the situational judgment stage, come to that in a moment. But for the stage two interview and for the stage three briefing and written, it's exactly the same, no matter what route you're going through, whether it's policing degree holder, whether it's PCDA, whether it's a DHEP, a detective route, police constable route, any, any route for a police officer, it's exactly the same online assessment center with the exception of the stage one situational judgment test. So the College of Policing do have their own situational judgment test, which is 12 questions where they give you a scenario and they'll tell you to act naturally, just be yourself, answer the questions honestly. That's the worst thing you can do. The yeah, worst. Yeah. Yeah. We have really... that, uh, CVF, you know, at the end of the act, you said that. Yeah. So you, you want to be, you want to answer the questions as if it's, if you, as if you were, the best version of your future constable self. That's how to pass that. Do not answer the questions honestly. Do not be yourself and do not act naturally. When I say don't be honest, I don't mean be a dishonest person. I just mean, you know, be a why, good why, actor. yeah, be a good actor. I mean, why? You're putting on a bit of a role. You're putting on a bit of an act anyway. I mean, I, I, some people have said, well, it, that, that can't be right. You're putting on a bit of a role. You, 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 you're role acting a, a, a part. I did it for 28 years. I was a police officer for 28 years. And when I went to the police station, when I went to headquarters or whenever I put myself on duty, I was a very different person to the person I really am. Um, I adopted a persona. Um, the, the, the sort of dad who gets frustrated with his children and... Um, loses a bit in the morning when they won't get ready for school is a completely different person that that's me by the way a completely different person to the persona i had when i uh, put on the inspector's uniform and had to had to act out a part now it, it's a part i i played very well i think for the most part but i suppose some people would say i, I wasn't being honest because i wasn't being the real authentic me i was being the best version of my constable sergeant or inspector self so in, in that respect i'd suggest i was role playing for 28 years and got away with it so you're doing the same thing it wasn't that i was being dishonest i was just being the best version of my future constable sergeant or inspector self but it wasn't the real me it wasn't the real me so i don't think it's being dishonest in that respect i think it's just being realistic about what they expect from you and adapting your approach for that now, things get more complicated because some forces can introduce their own situational judgment test or their own behavioural styles questionnaire. Uh, College of Policing gave them the freedom to do so. I have no idea why, because all it does is confuse things. Um, so some of you may have had to do an assessment where you were put in a position of being a steward at a sporting event where there'd be little videos played out in front of you. Someone running up to you saying, uh, can you help me? Can you help me? Um, I've lost my purse and it's... I've left it inside the stadium. I'm sure it's in the stadium underneath the seat as, yeah, Dan's nodding away. You've done this, haven't you, Dan? I feel your pain. Um, and they'll give you some options as to what to do because uh, you might have had an instruction that you're not to let anyone back in. Do you tell her to report it as lost property? Do you tell her there's nothing you can do? Do you tell her to come back next day when the, when the, sports, uh, when the, the grounds are open? Or do you say... Um, if you just wait a moment, I'll get someone to cover my post and I'll open up the doors and escort you to your seat where you were sitting. 
Uh, Dan, you've done this. Which one do you think is the best answer? Even though you've been, you've been told actually not to go back in, not that no one's allowed back in. Um, I can't remember what I put to it, to be honest. Um, it was it was a good couple of months ago now. Um, I think it was the well, it was the the best thing to do, I suppose, for her would be to let her go in and get it. But I think it was the we, we've done strict orders to not let anyone back in, so you have to come back tomorrow. Have to come back tomorrow, which would have been the incorrect answer. Yeah, I can't remember which one I put. <laughs> The correct answer would be to get someone to cover your post and, and uh, go back in. Um, that would be the most effective. Um, I'd, prob I'd, I'd notify my supervisor as well. Uh, but, you know, there's something in the national decision model and the code of ethics that talks about doing the right thing. And even though you may have been given an instruction, you may sometimes have to go outside of that policy or instruction. The, the Code of Ethics makes it really clear that you can go outside of policy if you have a rationale for doing so. So I'd su suggest a really good service to a member of the public would be to help them get their, their uh, wallet back because they can't get home, they can't get a bus or a chain without their wallet. Um, is it going to disappear between now and tomorrow morning? They've got to schlep all the way back here just to go and get their wallet when they know where it is. It's underneath the seat in the stadium. And what's going to, is anyone going to get harmed as a result of this? No. So um, I, I think the way to think about these behavioural styles questionnaires where they, they, they give you these sort of, no, these situational judgment tests that are outside of the College of Policing one, or even inside of the College of Policing one, is to, to think, have one eye on the competency and values framework, and at the same time, have one eye on what I call the 10 people -ometer. The 10 people -ometer is something I've used, and I've used it to develop a rationale for making difficult decisions in the police service. And it's, it's based on you, um, imagine the next 10 people who walk past the police station and you tell them what you're about to do. You tell them what you're thinking of doing. If they all turn around and go, that's insane, that's bonkers, then it's probably insane and bonkers, don't do it. If they all say that's exactly what we expect from you as a police service, then that's exactly what you expect from you as a police service, so go and do it. Even if there's a policy that says that's not, the right, that's not what you should be doing. If you have a rationale for doing it, and it, can, it seems like, and it appears to be like, and you've thought about the options, and it's the right thing to do at the right time for the right reasons, then it is the right thing to do at the right time for the right reasons. So do it. But I'd also suggest at the same time informing your supervisor of what you're about to do. We don't want robots in the police. We don't want robots in the police. We want people who can think for themselves. You've got a power of arrest, after all, which is unique. You can take people's freedom away from them. So surely you should be allowed to decide whether someone goes back inside a, 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 a sporting ground to go and get the wallet. So Dan, does that make sense? That's, that's how you pass it. You, you, you pass it by thinking one eye on the competency and values framework. So you're the sort of person that makes good decisions, but collects information from a variety of sources before you do so. You're the sort of person who would take responsibility for solving problems. You don't refer people to different agencies. You take responsibility for dealing with the issue yourself. Do you work with other people to help resolve issues? Do you take on challenging tasks without being asked to do so? Do you challenge inappropriate behaviour, no matter who the person is who's demonstrated the inappropriate behaviour? Do you learn from experience? Do you adapt to change? Um, do you have a positive outlook towards learning? Do you recognise that you're going to make mistakes sometimes and learn from them? Because it's the learning from them that's the important stuff. Do you um, believe in doing the right thing for the right reasons at all times? Um, and, and you know, if you are those things, if you if you put yourself in the shoes of those things, you will pass the SJTs and you'll pass the behavioural styles questions, um, which is the, a new national SIF that's been introduced. So some of you will be doing this. It's SJTs plus um, a behavioural styles questionnaire, and uh, not all forces are doing it at the moment. But it's a way of sifting people out before the online assessment centre. Why? Because the online assessment centre is expensive to administer and thousands of people are going through it and it's costing the police a fortune. So they can sift people out using an automated system that doesn't have any human resources cost at all. So uh, there you go, Nailu. Does that, does that help in answer your question? Yes, it does. And um, in the email which I received from Pam's Valley Police, they say, 
once I finish, I mean, saying that I'm passing the SJT, then I'm going to be straight in the interview right yeah. after. Um, yeah, you will be. said some forces, they do it, some forces, they don't. Yeah, some forces have their own SJTs. You, you, you don't, you'll then get links to the rest of the online assessment centre. Uh, but for forces like Thames Valley, who use the College of Policing system, you'll do this, the 12 situational judgment test questions. And as soon as you finish that, you go straight into, I think you've got an hour to do it in. Um, you go straight into the stage two interview. So there's no break. So you need to be ready to do your stage two interview straight yes, after the situational judgment you, test. I'm a little bit nervous. I don't know what to expect. Well, I've, I've done um, SJT questions, um, the ones what you said, and plus extra ones. Mm -hmm. But, you know, I just, <laughs> I'm a little bit nervous, to be honest. Well, um, are, you on, are you on the online course? Are you doing the Blue Light online course? The online, yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 The, the, Don't, uh, drop me a line and drop me a line and have a think about upgrading to the webinar package. The okay, uh, we'll do that. yeah, and you can come and join us for course number seven tomorrow. It'll be a little bit of extra pennies, but it won't be nearly as much extra pennies as what's on the website. Yeah, I, I mean, I got an email from Positive Action Team today saying they're gonna help us with that. Um, so hopefully, hopefully, I'll, I'm, I'm gonna get in. That won't be anything like as detailed as the help I will oh, be. Oh, yes, definitely. I yeah. will drop your line after that. Yeah, yeah, drop, drop me a line. Come and join course number seven. It starts tomorrow evening. Um, and any sort of nerves or um, anything you're not sure about, we'll, we'll knock that into the long grass. By the time you finish the webinars, you'll be absolutely chomping at the bit to get your stage two interview done. Um, you will. You, you will. You absolutely will. Um, because what we do is in those webinars is we actually practice interview skills we practice the stage three we practice the briefing we practice the written and just follow the matrix follow the templates i give you and and you will pass you will pass um and we look you know for the stage two interview we'll do that this thursday we look at things like i, I guarantee when we practice certain things will come up uh, a lack of structure uh, a lack of detail when it comes to not just what you did, but how you did things. So people saying things like, I approached a person calmly and professionally. Uh, I sat with them and listened in an empathetic way. Um, I worked in a collaborative fashion with my fellow team members to achieve the organizational aims. You know, all sounds great, but absolutely meaningless unless you describe how you did those things. Um, so that'll be the other thing. So there'll be structure, detail, uh, and the other thing, the other issue will be failing to answer the question. That's either you're answering a completely different question uh, or you are not being specific. So one of the things that often crops up is people talk about what they generally do as opposed to giving an example of a specific time when they've done something. And the problem is, is that if it's a force interview, if you start going down the wrong road, someone like me will help rescue you and say, I'm going to stop you there because I'm not quite sure if you understand the question. What the question is looking for is... So I'm just wondering if you could maybe start again uh, with a different example, because what you're telling me at the moment is about generally what you do in the workplace. It's like a job description. What I'm looking for is a specific example. So have a minute or two to think about it. Yeah, and, you said better to make yeah. a stick with you than to make a stick there. Yeah, but there's no one on the online assessment centre, there's no one to do that. There's, yeah, there's no well, one if, you mis if you do mistakes, you're out, that's it. You're, you're <laughs> you, stuck. You're, you can after six months you can come back well it's actually three months but uh, what we we don't plan to fail no when, when my clients say to me what, what 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 would happen if i failed um how long do i have to wait and sometimes i'll say to them i'm not answering that question <laughs> because if i answer that question that means that we're planning to fail follow my guidance follow what i show you do the hard work. I'll show you the way you do the hard work, you pass. And at Thames Valley Police at the moment, it's just an awesome opportunity because they have no force interview, Thames Valley Police. Um, Nailu, you could get to join the police in Thames Valley without speaking to a real person, uh, other than 
other than because you just do the online assessment center then you'll go to do your fitness where the hardest question you'll be asked is do you understand my instructions after they've told you what they require from you at the bleak test and you'll just go yes yes constable yes sergeant so that's not a hard question to answer is it and the other tough question you're going to get asked is what's your inside leg measurement when you go for your uniform fitting and the other tough question they're going to ask you is are there any medical conditions here that you've not disclosed for your medical and that's it so you can join the police without speaking to a real person in thames valley which is just bonkers but it is no, what it is. <laughs> take advantage of it so you know we are not planning to fail we don't do i'm coming back in six months because you've already set your mind up to fail you've already given yourself a, an excuse you've already said well if i don't get through this time i'll be all right i can come back in six months no that's not we don't think like that because as soon as we start thinking like that we're setting our mind up for fail failure as an option and uh, failure is not an option i'm sure i'm sure it's a line from a film somewhere failure is not an option right, yeah. i think yeah, it's a line it's from awesome. a film um but it's just not an option D do the hard work do what i ask you to do i'll show you the way you do the hard work you pass hey, drop me a line Nailu, and we'll see you tomorrow evening um awesome stuff all right any questions so far folks about anything we've covered or anything that you might be thinking i wish you i wish you'd said a little bit more about whatever it might be no all right looking at the time uh we'll keep pushing on so um dan you're asking about devon and cornwall topics for the final interview ah have you got to final inter interview stage before uh no i haven't this is my first time getting to the final interview stage Woohoo! right we need to make make ourselves ready the thing about devon and cornwall uh, their interview is um you know what sort of questions am i going to get asked they've the, the flipped and flopped and changed over the past few years devon and cornwall like a lot of forces do they change the style of their final interview so there's no real point in trying to keep up with this is what they're going to ask me because if if for example you've got a friend or a dear loved one who's gone to the interview today and comes back and says this is what i was asked tomorrow you could go for the interview and find a completely different interview because it might be split testing as in you have two two or three different versions of the interview or they might have decided to adopt a new interview style and new questions so what i suggest to people is you cover everything every eventuality so that you know when you're walking into the interview that you are prepared for every eventuality every type of question so there's a youtube video uh, which i i highlight in the blue light facebook group called uh, all the interview questions um I, I did a video where i uh, apart from some strength based ones that north yorkshire police use I'm, i've got to apologize i forgot to i forgot to include those but i did a video where i talked about every type of question you could get asked so Dan, the hard work is preparing for all of them. I actually, I actually watched that when I got home from work today. So that did right. give me an inkling. Did it make sense? Yeah, it did. It's 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 one of those where I said I haven't been given a date to my final interview yet. So I've just been told that I've been passed, and it's potentially going to be in April. It's potentially going to be in May. So yeah, it's just sort of. I suppose when I have a date, I'll know that I have to fine tune all of the different things. Then. Well, the hard work starts now. Um, we, we don't wait until our date before we start the hard work. We start the hard work now and start preparing for every eventuality. And what I'd suggest is, you know, get your head in the game uh, an hour every day and practice, practice, practice. So, um, you know, your, your motivation question, why do you want to be a police officer? Why Devon and Cornwall? What are the greatest challenges that Devon and Cornwall face? Uh, what current operations are we running to tackle x y and z or just what current operations we're running um tell me something about the force um tell me some f interesting facts about the force um what's the chief constable been saying recently about whatever uh, or just what's the chief constable saying recently who is the chief constable so a lot about corporate knowledge um uh, of the force and then your typical competency style questions difficult decisions work with others taking responsibility for a task challenging inappropriate behavior managing and supporting change, um, doing the right thing, um, changing the style of communication to meet the needs of others. Um, and those are the typical sort of CVF type questions. 
and then moving into uh, questions like West Yorkshire Police don't even ask any of those questions anymore. They've just been them all. They ask questions about challenges and values, uh, what's important to you and um, what values are important to you and why. And closely followed then by, can you give me an example of a time when you've demonstrated one of those values? So, um, and impact, you know, what sort of impact is being a police officer going to have on your personal life? Um, there's, there's so many ways of turning that answer into a complete and utter train wreck, especially if you read some of the, the books out there that I've not authored, uh, that have been authored by people who've never had a warrant card in their pocket. Because quite honestly, you know, some of the cliches and nonsense that are in those, some, some of those sample answers, um, I'd, I'd, I'd be shaking my head at you on the interview panel, thinking, how dare you disrespect me by BSing me like this? So yeah, there's a lot to do, Dan, uh, but it's within your gift to get all of those things done. And also you've got time now, so that there's one of my clients I'm doing some one-to-one -one work at the with at the moment, who has never challenged inappropriate behavior. He's a corporal in the British Army. I don't believe for one moment that he's, and I did say to him, you're a corporal in the British Army. Don't try and persuade me that no one's said or done anything inappropriate around you. And he said, no, no, honestly, no one ever has. No, come on, tell it to someone who, you know, believes you, because I don't. Um, get yourself out there and find one of your poor and suspecting soldiers who's going to get picked up for doing something inappropriate. You're not going to leg them, but you're going to do something to help support them. But go out there and find the example and put yourself in that uncomfortable position so that when it comes to your interview, when you're asked a question about that sort of thing, you've got an answer. Because at the moment, you've got no answer whatsoever. And you'll fail based on that. You'll fail based on that. So you've got to line your ducks up. And that often means throwing yourself into um, something uncomfortable, something you've never done before, so that you've actually got the evidence that you can talk about at your interview. Does that make sense, Dan? Yeah, perfect. Thank you. Does it, does it feel a bit daunting? Uh, it does a little bit because this is, as I say, this is like the first time that I would have actually spoken to a person throughout the whole recruitment stage. And you know, I've been trying to get more information off. I know a few people that are currently serving, recently joined, been in the force for a long time. But like you say, it's almost like, you know, that could have changed like, from day to day. So just sort of trying to get, a, 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 I suppose, sort of a broader idea of what they're asking. But yeah, it's going to be the first time I would have spoken to someone. You now I don't even know whether it's on Teams or whether it's face to face yet. I don't know. Um, but yeah, actually had some interaction with a physical person rather than just going through the application process online. Yeah, and bear in mind that the people like me, you know, this the, your final interview is a you know the online assessment centre. You can game that. You can game play that. But when it comes to your final interview you're up in front of a serving sergeant or a serving inspector. And they, they're out on the operational front line and they use operational officers like that because there can be no criticism then of the standard of recruits. Because if, this, if an inspector starts bellyaching to an assistant chief constable about the standard of recruits, the assistant chief constable will just look at the inspector and say, well, you were the ones who recruited them. So sort yourselves out inspectors. Um, and a lot of the guidance I've seen out there over the years, especially those, the guidance authored by people who've never been in the police, is, on, and I've had people at those, I've had people at interviews give me the sort of cliched BS that frankly just makes me angry. Because I think, you know, how dare you disrespect me? I wouldn't say it, but I'm thinking it. I'm thinking, how dare you disrespect me? Come into this interview and completely trying to, BS me with cliches and, and nonsense like this. I, I, I don't, it, you're not sharing anything about yourself, and you think you can come and you think you can come and BS me. I'm an inspector in the police. You know, I didn't get there by collecting tokens from Cocoa Pops packets. I got there by doing my best to be the the best people person ever, because those are the traits they're looking for. They're looking for awesome people people. And I'm looking at you thinking, is there anything you've shared with me that's helping me decide whether you're the sort of person who can be on my team at four in the morning when it's all going pear-shaped? You've been on duty for 10 hours already. You're exhausted. You've had no rest. And the sudden death of a six-month-old baby comes in. You're the sort of person who's going to shout up and say, I'll go to that. 
Or are you the sort of person who's going to go, oh, I'm exhausted, someone else can do it? I'm looking for heroes. Um, so, you know, it's a time for the, your, your real, authentic and emotional self, but in a detailed and structured way. And that's what they're after then. So, you know, it, the, the, the time's now to start practicing. Uh, yeah. The time is now to start practicing. And uh, that, that will get you through. Get your head in the game. Get your head in the game. Uh, and for those of you who are planning to do your online assessment center, if you know there's an interview coming next, get your head in that game as well. Get your head in that game. Don't wait. So many people, you hear so many people say, um, I'll wait until I get the results from my online assessment center before I start preparing. Well, <laughs> too late for two people who got in touch with me today to say, I only got the results from my online assessment center last Friday and I've been given an interview date of this week. It's too late for them. It's too late. They've not done any preparation whatsoever for the final interview because they're waiting for the results of the online assessment center. And the turnaround in these two different forces is really quick. They've both got interview dates this week and they are both completely unprepared. Unless they really can get their head in the game or they're a natural at it, they're gonna fail at the interview because they're just gonna collapse under, under the sort of pressure of the sort of questions that they're gonna get asked. They'll be very friendly at the final interview. They're gonna be very friendly, very amenable, and like I said, they'll put the best people people in front of you. They don't want to put some of the ogres that are inside the police in front of you. They don't want to put you off. And trust me, there are some. You know, there's a lot of uh, there's a lot of inspectors and sergeants I knew and know still. I wouldn't put them anywhere near a new recruit. Nowhere near. Oh my goodness. It's the last place they need to be is anywhere near a new recruit because they'll put them off. Um, no, I'll keep them on a short leash for certain jobs in the police that need those type of characters. Um, yeah, anyway, get off, your, get off your soapbox now, Brendan. But final interview, honestly, you've got to take it seriously right from day one. Um, let's just see what else we got. So uh, is that, you're all right, Dan, you're okay. It's daunting, but you know, of course it's daunting. You want to join the police, you want a warrant card from Her Majesty the Queen. You better earn it. The police don't owe you a living and it's not going to get handed to you on the silver platter, as you well know, Dan, because it sounds like you've been really you know, been going for it for, for a while. Let's get you over the line this time. Let's get you over the line. Um, Will, gosh, that was a big question, Will, you asked me there. The, so uh, one piece of advice for the stage two, make sure you talk about your how. Yeah, use the structured approach I show you. Um, and it's the detail that's missing because it's the detail that ticks the boxes and the behaviors. So if I dig out, you know, if I dig out, there's my, my question sheet there. Here's one for, um, we take ownership. Sample questions there. Um, tell me about a time when you've taken responsibility for solving a problem or, or a, a, a challenging task or overcoming an obstacle. Could be worded anything like that, but, when you look at the behaviours that I put down there, these behaviours, that, that's the English version that's been taken from the College of Policing Competency and Values Framework, which is just a load of HR gobbledygook. Uh, I, I, I understand stuff like this. I geeked out on this for about three or four years. I did a master's in education where I focused on personnel evaluation systems. I know being around me then must have been so exciting. <laughs> Honestly, I took books on holiday with me called The Personnel Evaluation Systems and Standards from the University of Western Michigan. What a, what a read. I read half of it on the plane. It's great. Um, what a geek, though. But I've translated all of this into this sort of thing, which makes English, makes, you know, it turns it into English for you. The, the detail is hit when you talk about the how. So in, for example, We Take Ownership, um, how did you seek the views or feedback on the problem from others? How did you go about helping others involved in the problem solving? How did you get others to help or support you in the problem solving? How did you react to any mistakes made or when things didn't go to plan? How did you identify your strengths and areas for development? What did you do to address these? That's the detail that's mostly missing. You know, how did you get views and feedback from people? I want to know about the type of questions. I want to know about the sort of meeting you arranged. I want to know about how you listen to people and how you dealt with people who didn't agree with you or, or, or who were obstructive. And don't try and persuade me that everything you touch turns to gold because it doesn't. It doesn't, you know, especially a final interview. 
God, the amount of times at interviews, people would be like trying to persuade me that everything they touch is brilliant. And I'd, I'd, I'd be either thinking, you're either trying to BS me and none of this happened, or you've over the pudding so much that only half of it happened. Or the other reason why it went so well is because it wasn't even a challenging task for you. I want to hear about, so that's the other thing I'd say, Will, there's two bits to it. It's not just detail, but I want to hear about something that's actually a problem, especially when you're warming yourself up for final interview, because you can reuse the same answers, reuse the same scenarios. But um, I want to hear about something that's challenging and problematic, because it makes for a much better answer, and it's more realistic. Uh, the amount of times people try to persuade me that, honestly, they're just supermen and women. Um, and they don't need any development because they're just awesome already. Come on, it's BS, that's rubbish, that. It's absolute rubbish. I won't believe them. I won't believe them. So uh, stage three advice, uh, quite simply, just follow my... Uh, you, you're on my course, aren't you, Will? Yeah, you're on... Yeah, you're on... Yeah, thumbs up. Just, just follow the written exercise problem-solving methodology. Um, and for the briefing exercise... Where is it? Where's my briefing exercise? So there's the sample briefing exercise. Um, just do that. Um, watch all my videos. Uh, repeat after me. No, thanks. thanks, Brendan. That's great. And um, <clears throat> yeah, as you can see, got some of your, your, your sheets printed off here. Um, had the videos on and the way to work in the car. So I've been, yeah, I've been trying to trying to make it that obsession you talk about um, but no that's great and i think um certainly on the stage two i think i might might jump on that that course that starts tomorrow and upgrade to the to the webinar um just to just to really round that out because i think i've got some good answers and i've been structuring some stuff out but um i really want to make sure that those examples um you know that i'm going into the right level of detail and, and really nailing down that how and and how that problem was was addressed It'd be, it'd be so worth it. I know, I know you know, you, you might be thinking, oh, he would say that, but it really is. It's just so worth it. I've never had anyone do the webinars who'd come off them and said, well, that was a waste of time. Uh, never, ever, full stop, or not anywhere close to it. Um, you know, for those of you watching us on the replay, just, just, just go to Trustpilot and put blue light in and see what people are saying. You know, I've got five stars on Trustpilot, 4.9 with awesome feedback that I'm proud of, that I've worked hard for, and I work hard for it because I want you to succeed in your dreams. Um, that, that's, that's where I get the pleasure from. Uh, people like you, Will, in six months' time or four months' time saying I've got the job. Or the one I really get, really, I really love is when I get the photographs of people at the Passing Out Parade with their family and friends, proud of them. Just, just awesome, 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 awesome. So it's worth the investment. Uh, drop me a line after, and I'll, 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 I'll show you a way to come and join us tomorrow night, which won't be anything like as much as it is to upgrade via the website. All right. Appreciate that, Brendan. Thanks a lot. To, to thank you for your time tonight. I mean, you've invested an hour of your time tonight. Um, so, you know, I appreciate that as well. It's your time and it's precious. Um, so, yeah, quite simply, stage three, just, just follow my problem-solving methodology. Um, be a, as, as, as so many people who've got 90, 90 plus percent in the stage three have said, just be a clone of Brendan, just just clone clone me. Um, th this was something I geeked out on when I was in the police problem solving. I was just strategic lead in Greater Manchester Police for problem solving for a year um, and community engagement. Um, I had some awesome opportunities after I've spoken at conferences, I've worked with police forces, worked with the European Union on the International Advisory Board for uh, a big project that was looking to improve community engagement and problem solving in the Central and Eastern Europe, uh, which was just incredible. Um, so it's my thing. So everything, even though you may be thinking that sounds a bit dynamic or that sounds a bit um, like something the police aspire to uh, doing, in terms of their problem solving capability and enabling citizens rather than just serving them. Um, it, will, it will get you really, really high marks. And, and it's not just Brendan's wacky ideas, it's all underpinned by research as well as to what works. Um, and I've done all the work, you know, so 20 years worth of experience in, I don't know, is it 20? 
When did I go into neighbourhood policing? 2004. 18 years worth of experience in community engagement and problem solving, because it's still work I do now. It's still work I do now, although not nearly as much. Not nearly as much, but no, you'll, you'll love it, Will. Um, you'll walk the stage three, because you'll just be a clone of me. Thanks, Brent. Appreciate it. Yeah, awesome stuff. All righty. I think that's everything. Did we cover everything tonight, folks? Give me a thumbs up. Yeah. All right. Lexia, did we cover everything? Just, yeah. So Lexia's looked very thoughtful all the way through tonight. <laughs> is there anything? So I noticed it's, it's a small group. It's a small but select group. I know there's some people here. And if you watch this on the replay, you'd be thinking, there's other people? Yeah, you, you don't get to see them, though, because the, the Zoom only shows people who are here who are on, got the videos on. There's other people who are here who have not got the videos on. And that's OK, because you might be at work or something like that. I get that. I get it. All right, we've overrun by 13 minutes. Who cares? Who cares? I, it's been good. I've enjoyed it. But before we go, opportunity to ask any questions. Because in a moment, I'm going to go and you'll be thinking, oh, I wish I'd asked. Brendan. Go on, Tom. Uh, go on, Lexia. When, two, two questions. One from Tom, one from Lexia. Go on, Tom. Sorry. Um, yeah, when does your... I know you've got Course 7 starting tomorrow night. When does your Course 8 start? Because I'm un, unable to make the dates for Course 7. Um, I, I, I need to get my app together with that, don't I? It's the problem, problem being is I've got Easter holidays coming up and my kids get three weeks off. Can you believe that? Three weeks off for Easter. Um, so I've got to I've got to work out um, good times and dates. I will, and course eight dates will go on very soon. Actually, I should work on that tomorrow. I'll get some course eight and nine dates on um, over the next. Do need to email tomorrow. you to say we want to be on that course? Yeah, if you've if you've lined yourself up for the online assessment centre program, but I mean you've got I mean, keep your eye on that. But the, the your, your head needs to be in the interview game at the moment. Well, that's why I think Course Seven is too early for me to think about it, and that's why yeah. I want to go to Course Eight, which will start obviously in April, which is perfect timing for me. Yeah, it'll be sometime in April, um, and it'll probably follow a similar format of Tuesday and Thursday evenings. And if you, I know some people can't make them sometimes, but uh, there's recordings of them. And if you ask me nicely, um, I'll send you, you know, um, opportunities to watch recordings of previous courses, webinars. So, you know, you can forget Amazon Prime and Netflix for the next few months. You're just going to geek out on Blue Light TV. You'd be sick of the sound of my voice. Um, my actually, missus will be so happy. What's that, Tom? My missus will be so happy putting that on the television. <laughs> she, <laughs> I've had feedback like that before, actually. A couple of weeks ago, someone dropped me a line and said, my husband is overjoyed because he doesn't have to listen to you anymore. Because even with the headphones on, we're going to bed at night. And, uh, you know, it's like 11 o'clock at night, bedtime. What am I doing? I'm listening to you um, on YouTube or on, or, or on the online course. And my husband's like, look, there's a third party, party in our marriage at the moment. There's a third person and it's got to stop. And I, I felt like, God, I'm glad you passed because it might have been a divorce if, uh, <laughs> if you hadn't. So, yeah, um, when you're sick of the sound of my voice, you know you're doing enough work. Uh, great stuff, Tom. Great stuff. Uh, Lexia, what's your what, what can we help you with, Lexia? Mine's just more of a genuine, like, general question. Like, I've passed my OAC, I think it's called. Yeah. Thankfully, I just winged it because I didn't really know what I was doing, but I did it. Um, <laughs> Sometimes you don't need Brendan. <laughs> I, don't, I don't know how I did it, but I did somehow. But um, I'm applying for North Yorkshire, but I'm actually from Hull. So by the time I do get in, hopefully, I'll be a new driver. So I kind of didn't want to go all the way to Scarborough. Are you allowed to like request somewhere closer, like Selby or something like that? The good news <laughs> is um, North Yorkshire is an awesome place. I, I know that because I live here now. Uh, we moved here. We, we, I live in York, you know, so um, it's just awesome. Just yeah. quite a beautiful, incredible county. Um, the force itself seems to have, I mean, I had a contract, Blue Light had a contract with, with North Yorkshire Police about six, seven years ago to deliver their initial training. When, when, when it's much bigger business, I made it smaller on purpose because I didn't like having a big business. Yeah. Um, and uh, I've got to say, it seemed like a force that was set in the 1970s still. Um, but the good news is, not anymore. I, I think they're really switched on force now and they've made a lot of changes over the past several years. 
so it's a really good force to join. Will they be sympathetic to you if you live in Hull and, you know, Garborough, Whitby, North Allerton? Yeah, that's where my interview is. I have no idea how I'm getting there yet. North Allerton, Hull to North Allerton yeah. is about an hour and a half. Um, yeah. I, I drove, so York's fairly, York's 30 minutes away from the southern part of uh, North Yorkshire. I yeah. drove to the border with Cleveland for uh, to take take my sort of family out over the weekend to the Cleveland Way, which is just on the border. That, that took us an hour and a quarter from York to get to the northern part of, so that's just past North Allerton. Yeah. So North Allerton, there's, they're not going to base you in places like that. Right. What they might do, they might be keen to base you in Scarborough. Yeah. Because Scarborough's short of waters, but Holt to Scarborough, that's a bit of a nightmare journey, that, isn't it? Yeah. So they'll be so yeah. they'll be all your work. Yeah. But if they ask you the question, are you prepared to work anywhere in the force? The answer is yes. Right, okay. <laughs> that could be a game changer. Uh, well, she's not prepared to move her out. So. Yeah. Yeah. And uh might have to move out. Yeah. At some point. That, that might be a fact of life one day, having to move out of Hull. Yeah. Uh, move to North America somewhere. Um, you've got a strength-based interview to prepare for. It's not strength-based at all. If you look up strength-based interview on Google, it's not what you're going to get. Right, OK. Um, it's very, very different. And also you've got micro tasks to do as well, micro exercises. Right. Um, which I do believe is a vision and dealing with someone who's vulnerable. Yeah. So they're very much like a situational question. How would you deal with this scenario? Um, the, the rest of it is questions like, uh, yeah, uh, hang on a second. There's one I prepared earlier. Uh, this, this is from a one-to-one -one -one work I did with someone who'd actually failed the North Yorkshire interview. Uh, North Yorkshire doesn't seem to have changed the questions, although it might do soon because Phil Kane, the Deputy Chief Constable, was the person who introduced this strength-based approach. Right. And the next step, you constable might think, I don't like this approach. Uh, right. uh, Mabs saying, What's the deputy constable's name, Lexia? I swear she's called like Lisa or something. No, that's a constable. Oh, I have no idea then. No, your force. Lisa or something. <laughs> I have no idea. That'd be Lisa Winwood that you're thinking. Oh, yeah, that's the one. Yeah. Uh, there's a new deputy chief constable. So, questions like uh, when work might when work might overload you, how will you look after your physical and mental well-being? Um, how would you work collaboratively with other organisations? Um, when you work under pressure, how do you know when you need to be for help? Uh, what does exceptional community service look like to you? So, those are sort of questions you're going to get. Right. Okay. Thank you. If if they stay with the current format. They might just change everything. Might just yeah. Change. I mean, so, I'm at college, like, at the minute, luckily doing public services, so I have quite a lot of help behind me, you know, like, with the recruitment team at Humberside to help me. I think that's where I've sort of got lucky in a way. Right. So, come and join us on the weekly webinars. Not yeah. this one, but come and join us on the practice ones for the, for the yeah. interview, where we practice interview skills. All right, thank you. All right, okay, let's have a quick look at the chat. I guess there's a couple of things in there. Um, Will saying West Mid's going back to face-to-face -face interview. Currently, there's no interview. I should hope so. Dave Thompson, my old, uh, as a sergeant with him, chief constable of West, Mid West Midlands Police, should be holding his head in shame at the moment that he's not doing any kind of interview, that people can join West Midlands Police without speaking to a real person. Um, I've challenged him and prodded him on Twitter about this a few times. So maybe... Maybe he's worked out that I'm, um, he's just banking away a lot of problems for the future. Um, so, yeah, they may introduce their interview again. Um, West Midlands Police, anyway, have over recruited. Um, I know that they are pushing people towards Staffordshire and West Mercia uh, because of the, the, their talent pool has got too many people in it. All right, folks, well, listen, um, awesome, awesome. Uh, Charlie, I've got my interview for the special constable role tomorrow morning. Charlie, go get it. Go go and do awesome. Uh, oh, and there's a message there for Lexia uh, from Sarah. I'm also in North Allerton, so we could meet up if you want to. 
that'd be amazing. You form a little study group. I, I love that when when um, blue light community members get together and form little study groups and buddy groups and things like that. I just think it's amazing. I think it's amazing. So. Um, uh, Dan's wishing uh, Charlie good luck. You'll notice I never wish anyone good luck. If you're relying on luck, you've not done enough preparation, quite simply. So I never I never wish any of my clients luck. Some of you know that already. Anyway, I'm going to see some of you two on course seven tomorrow night, which would be awesome. Uh, for others who are preparing for their interview, um, drop me a line and um, I can share with you to thank you for the hour that you've spent with me. I can share with you a route into the opportunity to do the online interview course and to practice with me for two hours every week, which if that doesn't get you ready for your final interview, I don't know what will. I don't know what will. Uh, thanks for joining me, folks. And if you're watching this on the replay, um, if you've got any questions, stick them in the comments below. And I'll get back to you soon. And I'll speak to you soon. Take care and see you all very, very soon, my friends. Bye-bye for now.